Oma Gyana Timirandasya Gyananjana Shalakaya Chaksur Militanyena Tesmai Shri Gurave Namaha Namam Vishnu Padaya Krishna Pristaya Bhutale Srimati Bhakti Vedanta Swaminiti Namine Namaste Sarasati Devi Kauravani Pracharine Nirvisesha Shunyavadi Paschatya Deshatarine Vanchakalpa Tarubhyasya Kripa Sindhu Bhaihevacha Patita Nam Pavanebhyo Vaishnavibhyo Namo Namaha Jai Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Gadadhar Shri Vasadi Gaur Bhakta Vinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare so welcome all the devotees to our ongoing study, Bhakti Shastri, and we're studying Bhagavad Gita, right? Unit one. We're, this is lesson number number seven. Yes. Is it? Yes, Maharaj. Yes. Okay. Lesson number seven. Everyone can see the. Slideshow? Yes, Maharaj. Okay. All right, so the title of the slideshow today, the lesson today, Varnashram Dharma, a support to Krishna Consciousness. Oh, let's go back. Okay, wait. Revision. In the last class, we talked about the appearance of Lord Krishna and his mission to establish Dharma and the ultimate principle of Dharma, surrender to Krishna. So Lord Krishna's mission in coming into the world to establish Dharma and what is that Dharma? The ultimate Dharma is to surrender to Krishna. Then we talked about under what circumstances following Varnashram Dharma is necessary. Does anyone remember under what circumstances is following Varnashram Dharma necessary? Who can... Who can tell us? For those who are not <coughs> Yes, Maharaj. Yeah, Hare Krishna Maharaj. For those who are not liberated. Right. That's right. Those who are not liberated yet, then they have to follow Varnashram Dharma. And what qualifications are required for beginning the practice of Krishna consciousness? Uh, no qualifications except sincere will. Except what? Uh, no will or sincere sincerity. Sincerity, yes, the sincerity to fa to practice and to follow the process and to take instructions. All right, and then we talked about the, the results of following Varnashram Dharma in comparison to the results of Sanatan Dharma. Would anyone remember what were some of the results of following Varnashram Dharma? Hare Krishna Maharaj, uh, following Varnashram Dharma, we can uplift, uh, like the one person can uplift himself to even to the heavenly planets. Uh, but following uh, Krishna consciousness, one can apply to the spiritual world. Mm -hmm. And even Kshatriya can become Brahman uh, while following uh, Varnashram Dharma. 
uh, and uh, while following sanatan dharma one can get free from even sinful uh, acts krishna consciousness by following sanatan dharma we yes. can get free from sinful Sin reactions okay yes good varnashram dharma is like the stepping stones right yes stepping stones leading to where to uh, to sanatan dharma <laughs> to uh, to spiritual world well not exactly to get, tran to get transcendence from uh, the material world Vanashram Dharma are stepping stones to self-realization. Yes. Okay, and then finally, the practice of Krishna consciousness is transcendental to Vanashram Dharma. In other words, Krishna consciousness doesn't depend on any particular Varna or Ashram. One can practice Krishna consciousness in any position. All right? And then, okay, so here is uh, Arjuna, Arjuna's arguments against fighting, compassion, enjoyment, sinful reactions and destruction of the dynasty. And Krishna defeated these arguments. We see Krishna's different arguments, Jnana, Karma Kanda, Buddha Yoga or Karma Yoga and Karma Yoga in the different places in the second and third chapter where these arguments are given to defeat Arjuna's arguments. So Krishna was establishing the need to practice. All right, now Vanashram Dharma, an example for society in general. It's important. The example should be there. This is Vanashram, one of the important points, the purposes of Varnashram, that it, it, it helps people to show a good example. We need to show an example to people, how to properly act, how to behave. It's all very important. So Bhagavad Gita Prabhupada writes, a self-realized man has no purpose to fulfill in the discharge of his prescribed duties nor has he any reason not to perform such work. Hmm? This is from the Bhagavad Gita 3, 18 to 20. Therefore, just for the sake of educating the people in general, you should perform your work. This is like Lord Krishna instruct, instructing Arjuna the importance of Showing the right example. Do your prescribed duties. There's no reason. He's a self-realized person, one who is actually situated on the transcendental platform, is self-realized. So he has no purpose to, act, to fulfill. He doesn't want to get anything. There's no reason for him to do his duty, but there's also no reason for him not to do it. So what's, how should we understand that? Therefore, for the sake of educating the people in general, you should do your work. You should do your work. Why? Because it shows the right example to educate the people, to see the right example. They need to see people acting proper. And then they would say, oh, you know, just like he did, we should also do. So each of the different varnas and ashrams, they have their different duties. And we're expected to act according to the positions in these different varnas and ashrams. We have to show the example. It's one thing to teach people and to talk to them and tell them do this. But if you don't show the right example, what is the good? It's useless. I always give the example about the teacher who always tell, would tell us, don't smoke, but the teacher smokes. So the teacher's smoking, but he's telling the students not to smoke. So what are the students supposed to think? That why is he telling us not to smoke when he smokes? And there's another uh, pastime, a 
Prabhupada, uh, not Prabhupada, but one senior devotee, he always tells the story about the, the boy who was fond of eating sweets. So the mother took him to the doctors and she asked the doctor, can you tell my son not to eat sweets? So the doctor said, okay, come back in a week. So the, the lady went away and she came back with her son after a week. And then the doctor said, don't eat sweets. So the lady said, why didn't you tell him that last week? The doctor said, well, last week I also eat sweets. So if I'm going to tell him not to eat sweets, I have to do it myself. I can't tell somebody to do something which I'm doing myself. I can't tell them not to eat sweets if I eat sweets. So the, the same here, for the sake of educating the people, you should perform your work. You should work. We should show the example. Not to just enjoy the results, but just for the sake of doing your duty. That is the idea. So that is karma yoga. That is detached work. When you do your duty in a detached manner. That is actually karma yoga. Hmm. 325. As the ignorant perform their duties with attachment to results, the learned may similarly act, but without attachment, for the sake of leading people on the right path. And so ignorant people, uneducated common people, they do their duties and of course they want to enjoy, they're attached to the results. They want to enjoy the results of their work. But the learned, those who are educated, self-realized, they will do it, they will, lead, they will do their work without attachment. And they're doing it for the sake of leading people on the right path. So we have to show that example. There has to be this example of detached work. And then other people will be inspired to follow. Text 22. Third chapter, O son of Prita, there is no work prescribed for me within, within all the three planetary systems, nor am I in want of anything, nor have I a need to obtain anything, and yet I am engaged in prescribed duties. So here you can see Lord Krishna is giving himself as an example. Krishna says he does, there's no reason for him to work. He's the proprietor of the three worlds. Everything belongs to him. So he's, he's not in need of anything. He doesn't want anything. But he's engaged in doing his different prescribed duties. When he lived in Dwarka, he would go to the palace in Dwarka and he would attend to the affairs. What is going on? What are the needs? What has to be attended to? He was very dutiful. He would carry out his different responsibilities with great care. He would even go around the kingdom and make sure everyone was performing their duties properly. And so this is, this is uh, the duty of the king or the ruler. He didn't have to do it, but he did it because he, has to, he wants to show the example to others. Right? From the purport of text number 22, third chapter. Although such rules and regulations are for the conditioned souls and not Lord Krishna, because he descended to establish the principles of religion, he followed the prescribed rules. Otherwise, common men would follow in his footsteps because he is the greatest authority. So Lord Krishna gave himself as an example and the other, there's another example also given in the third chapter. Who else followed, who else uh, showed the example? He didn't need to do anything. He was already self-realized. Yes, right. Janaka Maharaj. Janaka Maharaj is a great king. Uh, 
he would give charity and he would give charity profusely so much that people could they couldn't take even all the charity which he was giving them and when that people when there were when there was disturbances in the kingdom then Janak was there he would come out and he would fight and he would chastise the people who were disturbing the law and order in his kingdom but he didn't have to do all those things but he did it because he wants to show the example he's one of the mahajans so common men follow in the footsteps Lord Krishna says, if I did not perform prescribed duties, all these worlds would be put to ruination. I would be the cause of creating unwanted population. So can you understand this point which is being made here from the 24th verse of the third chapter? Krishna is saying, I would be the cause of creating unwanted population. Now what did Arjuna say earlier about unwanted population? Yes, uh, Krishna Maharaj. Uh, Arjuna mentioned um, one of the reasons that he shouldn't fight um, because, you know, there will be loss of family tradition and in the end it would lead to unwanted population or Yes, right. Arjuna was arguing that if I if I fight it will be the cause of unwanted population. But here Lord Krishna is saying if I don't fight, if I don't do my duty, that will be the cause of creating unwanted population. So just just the reverse of what Arjuna was understanding. Arjuna was arguing in favor of not fighting, but Lord Krishna is saying, well, if you don't fight, that will be the cause of unwanted population. All right, so you can understand how Lord Krishna has defeated all the arguments of Arjuna. He's an expert uh, teacher, and politician and he's really destroyed all of Arjuna's arguments and here's this wonderful verse very famous verse we often see this verse in the newspapers and maybe there's an obituary you know some somebody left the body and they'll put a picture of some big businessman, some great magnet, a head of a corporation, and they'll put this verse beside it. And they'll say, whatever actions a great man performs, common men follow. So, acharati shristas, shristas, the respected person, the shrista, respected man. And then the jana, the common men will follow. So who are actually the respected men? Who are the great men? The, we should understand who is actually great. It's not that somebody is great just because he built a big business empire and made a lot of money, made a big, made a big business. He, you know, business is ba often based on a lot of lying and, and stealing and cheating. You know, if, if we were to examine the lives of so many great businessmen, we'll find that in the course of their lives there were so many incidents where the, they did many things which were not quite legal. Anyway, that's another topic. But we, we tend to find that, you know, people come up in the world, in the material world, they come up in the world, because they're very expert in business and business is often based on that kind of thing. A lot of uh, cheating and corruption and finding ways to go around laws. Anyway, uh, we, do need, we do need great men, 
we do need important you know, people to show the right example, to influence the common people. And whatever, whatever standards he sets by his acts, all the world pursues. Prabhupada, in talking about this verse, he would tell the story about the, the laundry man who had a donkey. And the donkey was called Sar Sargosin, Sarvasin or Sargosin. And so this laundry man had a donkey. And the laundry man was very attached to his donkey. But when the donkey died, the man was so afflicted that he shaved his head. So it's customary in Hindu society when somebody senior in the family leaves the body, it's customary for the family members to shave their head. So this uh, laundry man decided he would shave his head. And after he shaved his head, then he continued with his work and he went to his different customers. And he met some, he met customers, uh, there was a couple of soldiers he met. And the soldiers asked him, oh, what's wrong? Why have you shaved your head? So the laundry man said to them, he said to them, oh, oh you don't know? You don't know? Sargo Singh is dead. And so the two soldiers who heard this, they thought, oh, oh. And the two soldiers, you know, they were so impressed with the laundry man that they thought, oh, we better also go and shave our head. And so the two soldiers shaved their head and then they went back to the soldier, to the military base. And all the other soldiers saw the two soldiers with the shaved head. And they asked him, why have you shaved your head? And the two soldiers said to them, you don't know, Sargo Singh is dead. And so all the soldiers, when they heard, they said, oh, Sargo Singh is dead, they all went and shaved their head. And in this way, all the soldiers shaved their head. And so then it happened, the next day, the king came to inspect all of his army. And he was very surprised to see all of his soldiers all had shaved heads. So he was asking, what happened? Why has everyone got a shaved head? And all the people, all the soldiers looked at the king and they all said, in unison, they all said, you don't know, Sargo Singh is dead. And the king looked at the, his ministers and looked at the officers around him and he said to them, who is Sargo Singh? And they were, they were scratching their head. They said, we don't know. We don't know who Sargo Singh is. Who's that? And so they asked these two soldiers. They found out these two soldiers had brought the news. Sargo Singh is dead. So the two soldiers went back to the laundry man. And they asked the laundry man, who was Sargo Singh? And the laundry man told them that, that was my donkey. So like this, sometimes you get... You know, blind people follow the blind, we say. The blind people follow the blind. So we do, we do want to follow, but we, we have a tendency to follow. We want to follow the great men, the shrestas, the actual uh, authorities, actual uh, pure and powerful men who can do things by proper standards who set the right standards and perform the activities which are a good example for others. We want to follow them. Just like it says, uh, Mahajano yena gata sapanta, follow in the footsteps of the Mahajans. The Mahajans, we want to follow them. Who are the Mahajans? Who are the great men? So we have to know. Not just people who are you know, good at business, but people who actually know the real standards for civilized society. So this is important. This is Varnashram Dharma, to show an example for people. Srila Prabhupada is Acharya, ideal teacher. So a little exercise with you. We want you to discuss with a partner. How many people have we got here today? 
45 Maharaj. 45, all right. So you have to make some, everybody has to have a partner, or there will be one group of three. And we want you to discuss a recent incident where others followed your example. And then what was the result for those who followed your example? Right? Think about this. A recent incident where others followed your example. And what was the result for those who followed your example? Is it clear? Yes. Yeah? Okay, we'll give you, give you a few minutes to discuss this. Is it okay we'll take five minutes, Maharaj? Well, all right. Yeah, I'll give you five minutes. No more than five minutes, right? Yeah. Hare Krishna. Can you think of an example? Where um, yes, Maharaj. People? It's not that recent, but um, around a year ago, uh, my classmate, he actually saw that I was uh, you know, only eating vegetarian food and avoiding onion and garlic. So he also uh, slowly started to avoid uh, non-vegetarian food and uh, slowly now he, he only eats uh, vegetarian food as well as he avoids uh, goods like onion garlic mushrooms and stops caffeine and everything wow did he start yes, to sir. chant did he start to chant Hare krishna uh i unfortunately not right now he just he started joining some krishna classes here the uh, youth krishna classes so hopefully he will okay good so that was a nice example yeah it's all right Did you ever follow anybody's example? Um, of course, Maharaj. Uh, uh, I, I follow my parents uh, in, the, in our, uh, you know, um, our Bhakti Krishna conscious practices, of course. I follow my parents and other senior devotees as well. Okay. And also Kirtan's programs such though. Yeah. Yeah, we all tend to follow others. We have that tendency, you know, we like to see an example. It's important for us. We get inspired if we see people get very enthusiastic. Sometimes we see them go out to distribute books, you know, and then we get, we think, well, oh, I should also go out and try and distribute books, you yeah. know. And sometimes you see people, they, one person starts to dance in the kirtan, and one person starts to dance, and everybody else starts to dance, you know. It's contagious. It's so we like to follow the example. We just have to be careful about who we follow, whose example we follow. Yes, of course. I saw one uh, movie one time, there was a script. Uh, it, it, they showed people inside a train and everyone was sitting very silently and all of a sudden one person started to laugh. And when one person started to laugh, he was just laughing and gradually other people all started and the whole train after a while, uh, everybody in the train, they were all laughing. <laughs> and so, you know, things are very, people are, everything is contagious, you know. Happiness can also be contagious. We can share it with others. <laughs> okay. So thank you very much for association. Thank you, Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Okay. Maharaja, we still have one and a half minutes to go. Oh, okay. One and a half minutes to go.
Maharaj, also I wanted to share something else that uh, me joining the Bhakti Shastri course, because I actually followed uh, my younger sister, she also joined the Bhakti Shastri course as well. So I also thought, why not? So that is why I joined the course actually. What, your younger sister joined first? Yes, uh, she actually joined first. Like, I had my you need some big exams right now, so I, I wasn't able to join. But then um, with my parents, she got along and she joined the classes. Mm -hmm. And so I thought, why not? So I also joined the class. Oh, okay. Did your parents also did, do the course? Yes, my parents did. Wow, wonderful. Yeah, it's, uh, it's good for us to have nice examples to follow. Yes, Max. So not everybody is so fortunate to have the good examples. People are often influenced by others, just like things like smoking and drinking, gambling. People are also influenced to these things by association. Yes, Max. Okay, it looks like uh, they're all coming back now. Yes, Maharaj. I'll take my leave. Thank you, Maharaj. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna Prabhu. Recording in progress. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna, welcome back everyone. So, we'd like to know what you discussed. Did you get any good examples? Yeah, who would like to share with us? Yes, Nithi Lamadu. Hare Krishna Maharaj. So we were two people. So uh, uh, one example was that uh, in our travel, Prabhuji uh, led the way and uh, he, he knew about the journey and uh, probably experience. So he uh, everybody followed him and it uh, it ended up to be a smooth travel so since he was aware so that went good and uh, from my side I, I don't have anything much but yeah I have uh, two kids so they they follow me whatever I do so oh. if I need a good example <laughs> it's uh, it, they, they do get impacted and they try to do that if I ask them to do they might not do but uh, um, if I do, if I'm reading something, they get interested to do it, so. Oh, very nice. Right. So you're very conscious to show a nice example for them. Yeah, hopefully, yeah. And lead them back home, back to Godhead. <laughs> yes, Maharaj, we will try for my sake. Yes. Anybody else like to share with us? Your mother. Hare Krishna Maharaj, Dhanrat Pranam. I wanted to share a very recent uh, experience of myself since I've been following his for quite some time. So there are some friends of mine, a bunch of them, uh, who have stopped eating non-veg and have started uh, chanting also, seeing me that how I've been, uh, you know, transformed uh, over a certain period of time and the quality of life that I'm leading. And the, they have seen me since my college days that how I used to be, I used to be an angry, uh, you know, <laughs> teenager kind of a thing. And now I'm quite calm, composed and always smiling and happy, spreading joy to everyone and uh, not much deviated from the problems of life so they have uh, you know observed me and now they have up and they asked me you know you uh, tell that how you transformed yourself I always told them about Krishna consciousness and the very first step they have taken is they have stopped eating non veg and started chanting also Ooh. so that was from my side and the, my partner was uh, Pran Rupa Mataji. She was running her own business and she stopped that and become fully devoted uh, to the service in the temple. And by seeing her, one of her staff also, uh, you know, got inspired and uh, she also started, uh, not full time, but started some sort of service in the temple. Oh, very so good. Both of us. Oh, all right. Thank you very much. So certainly we see it's... Uh, very common in the world among us that 
we do have that tendency to be influenced by others and follow their example. You know, there are so many things like fashion, which we, you know, people are influenced by fashion, what's the latest fashion, and people want to follow that. And even Prabhupada's hat, you can see that picture, Prabhupada's hat. And so in Prabhupada's time, it became common for devotees to get a hat like Prabhupada. They wanted to wear a Prabhupada hat. <laughs> And of course, we would wrap a chadar like Prabhupada, we'd follow Prabhupada. Okay, we'll go ahead. Lord Chaitanya said that a teacher should behave properly before he begins teaching. One who teaches in that way is called Acharya or the ideal teacher. Yes, if we're going to teach, it's important. We have to behave properly. That's the first thing. So it's not just knowing, but we also have to show the right example, the proper behavior. The king or the executive head of a state, the father and the school teacher are all considered to be natural leaders of the innocent people in general. All such natural leaders have a great responsibility to their dependents. So the king or the head of the state, the father, the school teacher, they're all leaders. So everyone has some kind of responsibility. We all have a duty to show the proper behavior, the proper actions to others. When Prabhupada was arranging to meet with Indira Gandhi, at that time Indira Gandhi was the Prime Minister of India, then Prabhupada wanted to impress on Indira Gandhi, uh, to impress on her the importance that all the members who sat in the, in the Senate, who sat on the Parliament, he said they should all be twice initiated Brahmanas and they should all strictly follow the four regulative principles. So that was Prabhupada, that was Prabhupada's plan to uh, introduce proper behavior among the leaders in India and the government in particular. He wanted that the, the, you know, the country should become God conscious and it's important for the leaders to show the right example. If the leaders are good, then it can influence everyone else. If, if the leaders themselves are corrupt, if they're full of all bad habits, then what are the common people supposed to think? Uh, I heard recently there was an, an incident in England. The Prime Minister of England, he had, had, he had a party in his, uh, in his residence. I think he was residing in the where the, the the prime minister of india of england is supposed to live and he 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 held a party there there was a lot of alcohol and everything and so you know that was uh, the standard of behavior for the the head of the country it's not the proper behavior it's not the kind of example you want to set for others rather the leaders they have a a duty to show the right actions, the proper behavior. Otherwise, their position as leaders is useless. They cannot have any good effect. We say the blind follow the blind. And if you follow a blind man, you go in the ditch. You have to, we have to follow people who have clear vision. So it's a great responsibility to accept a, a, a leading position. A few weeks ago we celebrated Ramayana and there's a pastime which is there in the Ramayana that tell, warns about the, the, the responsibility of being a leader. It said, uh, if you are responsible for the care of cows, or if you are responsible for the care of deities, 
or you may be responsible for the inmates in an ashram. So there are three positions of leadership, and three roles where a great responsibility is placed on the person in charge. One is taking care of cows, the other taking care of deities, and the other is taking care of devotees, if you like, or uh, holy people, people who have renounced the material world. And so it's a great responsibility to look after these people. And if we don't take care, if we don't look after them properly, then the reactions are very severe. If you have cows and you don't take care of the cows, it's very serious, it's a big offence because the cows are close to human beings and the cows are like our mother and they provide milk which is so important for the world. And the deities are non different from God and if we don't take care of the deities properly and worship them properly, keeping all the standards, the cleanliness and the punctuality, then it's very disgraceful and it will bring se severe reactions. Sometimes we see places where there was a temple and the deity was not properly worshipped. Sometimes the whole, the whole town the, or the whole village will just be annihilated, will just be destroyed. There will be a plague or a famine or a drought or something because they didn't take care of the deity. They didn't worship the deity properly. And th you may be taking care of an ashram, then that's also a very big responsibility. So taking care of people, having people depending on you, you have to be a, a good leader. You have to go out of your way and do everything required to look after them and to take care of them. So being a leader actually means to be the servant leader, not the, the master leader, but the servant leader. That's how we properly lead, by serving. Okay, so the responsibility there. Prabhupada explains, there must be first-class men, first-class men. So there must be one class of men, first-class men, ideal, that people will learn that here is an ideal class of men. Let me try to imitate or follow them. But there is no ideal man now, at the present moment. Everyone is sudra, kalo sudra sambhavaha then how the society will be happy? It is not possible because there is no ideal man. So here Krishna says that we should create, we should educate a section of men who are brahmana, by guna and karma, not by birth, then society will be happy. So our, this Krishna Consciousness Movement is that for the time being we are trying to create a section of men. Trying to create a section of men. What, what kind of section of men do you think Prabhupada is trying to create? First class Brahmanas. Yes, first class Brahmanas. By guna and karma, not by birth. Birth may be an advantage, but it is not just by birth alone. We have to have also the qualities and we have to work like a Brahmana. We cannot just simply claim, by birth I am Brahmana. So that is not actually Brahmana. Birth it may be an advantage, it may help one, but still you have to develop the qualification. So Prabhupada saw the need that Kali Yuga, he quotes, Prabhupada quotes Shastra, Kalo Sudra Sambhavaha. Everyone is a Sudra, everyone is low-born by birth. 
So, how can there be ideal class of men? So we have to educate people, we have to train people to be brahmanas. So getting proper education, spiritual education, to cultivate character, to cultivate the good qualities, that is what's required. It's not enough just simply to, just simply have the birth. Okay. Yes, somebody can read this for me. Yes, Sri Lakshmi. Attached attitude to the attached. Through fruitive activities and sense gratifications, sense gratification regulated by the Vedic rituals, one is gradually elevated to Krishna consciousness. Therefore, a realized soul in Krishna consciousness should not disturb others in their activities or understanding, but he should act by showing how the results of all work can be dedicated to Krishna. Bhagavad Gita 3.26 perfect. Thank you, Mataji. All right. So, fruitive activities and sense gratification regulated by Vedic rituals were gradually elevated to Krishna consciousness. So, that's a, that will take time to come to Krishna consciousness that way. Through fruitive activities and regulating sense gratification by Vedic rituals, gradually elevated. It's going to take a long time. But a person who is actually realized in Krishna consciousness should not disturb others in their activities or understanding. But he should act by showing how the results of all work can be dedicated to Krishna. So one who is in Krishna consciousness should show the example of dedicating everything to Krishna. In other words, he has to be detached. So the devotee shows the detached attitude and he shows that detached attitude to the people who are not yet devotees. They're not yet devotees. They're attached. So the, this is how the devotee can preach to the non-devotees. By his own example of being detached, he can show the example to those who are attached. And as we heard from you yourself, some of you were saying, you're describing, that when people saw you become a vegetarian, they also wanted to become vegetarian. This is common. It's a common thing. All over the world. You get people, they, they go to work and they bring the lunchbox with them. They're devotees and they bring the lunchbox with, with them. And the people who are there in the office, they see the devotees' lunchbox and they're envious. They think, oh, oh, you've got such so many nice things to eat. <laughs> You know, the other people, they're going to eat and, you know, in some greasy uh, fast food restaurant. They don't get anything very nice or very tasty or pleasing. That rather everything will be very expensive and unpalatable. But people will go there, they'll go and sit in these restaurants or in these uh, different canteens and they will eat this terrible, these terrible foodstuffs. And they will think, well, yeah. you know, they're thinking, well, there's nowhere else. And then the devotee, they see the devotees eating Krishna prasada, and then they're immediately attracted. And young children go to school, they bring their prasadam, and the other children see the devotee, the, the, the devotee children with their prasadam, the other children, they all want to have some of the devotees' prasada. This is, this is going on everywhere. So devotee wants to show the right attitude. 
we have to be detached. We know other people are attached. Well, we just do our duty. We just do. We're, we just practice Krishna consciousness. And just by being detached, that's the best preaching to these other people who are attached, showing them how we should properly live. Prabhupada gives an example here. Oh, this is from the 18th chapter, but Prabhupada's talking about the detached attitude to the attached. So vivaha yagna, the marriage ceremony, it is meant to regulate the human mind so that it may become peaceful for spiritual advancement. For most men, this vivaha yagya should be encouraged even by persons in the renounced order of life. Sannyasi should never associate with women, but that does not mean that one who is in the lower stages of life, a young man, should not accept a wife in the marriage ceremony. So we have the example how Srila Prabhupada went to America. So as a sannyasi, he saw young people coming, young men and young women, and he saw that you know, they were actually meant to be couples, they were meant to be married to each other. But who was going to do the marriage ceremony for them? So Prabhupada, although he was a sannyasi, and Prabhupada arranged to do the marriage for them. He didn't tell them, oh, this is Maya, no, you shouldn't get married, no, this is Maya. He saw their nature and he encouraged them, let them get married. But he himself, of course, as a sannyasi, he didn't associate with women. But for the, uh, the young people, young men, young couples, let them get married, have a marriage ceremony, and do the man. And Prabhupada sometimes would do the marriage even. In the beginning of a society, there was no one else there to perform the ceremony. So Prabhupada would do it himself to encourage the others. Let them be encouraged to take up Krishna consciousness. And so married life is, it's a, another responsibility. I need to show the example that Prabhupada wanted our devotees would show an example to others. And so in family life also devotees should be an example to other couples. Here you can see the picture of the four varnas, the Brahman, the Kshatriya, the Vaishya, the Sudra. So, so Prabhupada writes, so, so far we are concerned Krishna consciousness, so long our bodily concept of life is not completely eradicated, we must follow the swadharma of the body. We must follow the swadharma, the original nature of the body. So somebody by nature is a Brahman, Kshatriya, somebody is a Vaishya, someone is a Sudra. But when actually advanced, that is Mahabhagavata. Right? So in the beginning, we have to recognize the basic nature of the body, their propensity for work, what can they do, what kind of occupation is suitable for them. So someone by nature, they like to study, they like to worship the deities, they're very inclined to this kind of work. That is Brahmana, or sometimes we would say the intellectual class. And then you have the Kshatriya, who are the managerial and administrative class of people who like to guide and order and get people to do things, lead them and control them. 
And the Vaishya is a businessman, in the mercantile nature. He's always thinking, buy, sell, make money. And the Sudra is a worker. But when actually advanced, that is Maha Bhagavata. When one is actually advanced, then he's a great devotee. And he's very attached to hearing the philosophy of Krishna consciousness and preaching Krishna consciousness everywhere. So there are different kinds of people. Everyone should be engaged according to their different nature. Prabhupada writes, we should not imitate that, but our process is the more we advance in Krishna consciousness, we become transcendental to this bodily, bodily concept of life, Brahman, Kshatriya, Vaishya, Sudra. So we want to become transcendental to these things. Right? This is on the material platform, Brahman, Kshatriya, Vaishya, Sudra. But as we advance in Krishna consciousness, then we transcend these designations. So this is important to understand. Krishna consciousness is transcendental to Varnash. So this is from Bhagavad Gita. To chapter 2, text 31. Recording in progress. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Can you hear me okay? No. Hare Krishna. Can... Yes, Maharaj. Hare Krishna, yeah, you can hear me, yeah? Yes, yes, Maharaj. Yes, Maharaj, we can hear you. Okay. Okay, so we're speaking about Daivi Vanashram Dharma. Prabhupada explains, there must be the four divisions. In the social order of the present day, there is no Brahmana, no Kshatriya. Only there are some few Vaishyas and Sudras. So therefore, there is chaos all over the world. So the creation of these four divisions is very good for the society. And just like we, we see in, in a socialist environment, socialism, where there's a socialist country, then everybody is simply sudra. It's a movement of sudras. And in the Western world, you have a lot of people trying to be Vaishya and sudra. But we don't have any real Kshatriya or Brahmanas. But they're very much required. So Prabhupada said, because there's only Vaishyas and sudras, that's why there's chaos all over the world. So this Krishna Consciousness Movement is meant for creating some real Brahmana. At least there may be head, right? The, the Brahmana is the head in the social body. The Kshatriya are the arms, the Vaishya are the belly and the Sudra and the legs. So if you simply have a belly and legs, you don't have any arms, you don't have any head, then what kind of body is that? It's useless just to have legs and a belly. So Prabhupada said, at least there, must, there may be head. So there is need of some brahmana who can give advice to the people how to live, how to become God conscious, how to become happy. There is great need of this movement from Bhagavad Gita 2 verses 2 to 6. Prabhupada's preaching in Ahmedabad in 1972. So there's a great need to teach people how to organize society, how to live, how to become God conscious. People 
People need to be given this kind of education, this kind of advice. Who is going to do it? If there are no brahmanas, then there's nobody there to give the advice. And there's nobody to show the example. So this is the problem we are facing today. So Daivi Varnashram Dharma, giving everyone a chance to become, to take up on the responsibilities, to become Brahmana and to become Vakshatriya like that. Everyone has some duty to serve Krishna. So our movement is for creating people who can become Brahmanas. In the Kali Yuga, there are no real Brahmanas. So Krishna Consciousness Movement is meant for creating a class of people who can do the work of the Brahmana. Uh, Prabhupada writes, this is like an emergency situation. In the Kali Yuga, it's an emergency. There are qualified Brahmanas. So, who can do it? Anybody, anyone who will take up the responsibility, they can become Brahmana. Anyone can become Brahmana. Continue, Prabhu. Of course, they should be truthful. Like Sanatana Goswami quotes from the scriptures, that just like bell metal process. So anyone who is properly initiated and trained by a bona fide spiritual master can become a Brahmana. The question is, who wants to become a Brahmana? Who wants to be properly trained as a Brahmana? So when Prabhupada went to America, you may have heard he met this one man, there was this one man named Allen Ginsberg. Allen Ginsberg was a, uh, a beat poet. He was from the, the hippie era. And he was a poet and he wrote a famous book which he won an award for, and his book was called How. I thought he was an author and he was a poet and he was a leader of the young people. And so he had been to India and he knew the chanting of Hare Krishna and he knew about Brahmanas and he met Prabhupada and actually he helped Prabhupada. He gave Prabhupada money to help him to secure his uh, residency in USA in the beginning. So he was very helpful to Srila Prabhupada. Anyway, he said to Prabhupada, he said, he said, uh, oh, you, you want to make Brahmanas? He said, really? He said, that, that's, that would be very difficult. You know, the, Allen Ginsberg was a, a very much a, a rebel of the society. He had long hair and beard and and he spoke about all kinds of uh, hedonistic activities. In other words, he encouraged sense gratification. And so he told Prabhupada, he said, is it really possible to make brahmanas? Uh, you're, you're, you must be, aren't you being very conservative to try to make brahmanas? And Prabhupada explained to him, he said, well, qualification of the brahmana is, they have to follow four principles. Allen Ginsberg, he was thinking, oh, there must be many principles. But Prabhupada said, no, four. They just have to follow four principles. And if they get these four, then they can go on to become Brahmanas. Of course, just to follow four principles is difficult for people today. For Prabhupada, it was not difficult. Because Prabhupada's whole life had never even tasted tea. So for children who are born in the Krishna consciousness movement, then they're fortunate that they've had the proper upbringing and they can easily go on to become Brahmanas and to, from Brahmanas they can go on to become Vaishnavas. 
So that's what's required. Daivi Vanashram Dharma is to create Brahmanas, and the Brahmanas will go on to become Vaishnavas. And here's the, the verse from the 18th chapter. By worship of the Lord, a man can attain perfection through performing his own work. We don't have to do anybody else's work, just do our own work and we can become perfect. You see in the picture, this is a, the florist, Sudama, giving the garland to Krishna. So even it may be a very simple profession, but you do it for Krishna, that is perfection. Worship of the Lord through performing our own duty. You can attain perfection. Srila Prabhupada explains here from a morning walk in Mayapur. Prabhupada said, why a sudra artificially should be a brahmana? Let them, let him remain a sudra. And if he follows strictly the rules and regulations of sudra, he'll also be as good as a brahmana. Even if he remains a sudra and does accordingly, he will get the same position as devotee. Swakarmana tam abhyacharyasyam. He'll get the perfection. So we don't have to worry about what is our position in society. That's not important. Actually, modern society, we're all sudras. You may work in the big corporation. That is also sudra work. You're sitting in the big office of the multinational corporation. That is sudra work. You're an engineer, sudra. So why should the sudra become a brahmana? He doesn't need to. Let him remain a sudra. If that's his nature, let him remain a sudra. But he should follow the rules and regulations of sudra. Then he's as good as a brahmana. He may remain a sudra and he does the work. He will get the same position as devotee. Right? And the devotees, among the devotees, there's no question of Brahman, Kshatriya, Vaishya, Sudra. Everyone is devotee. That is perfection. Doesn't matter what kind of work you have, what kind of job you're doing. If you're doing it for Krishna, you're doing it according to the Shastra, rules and regulations, that is devotee. You get the position of a devotee. We want to bring everyone to that platform to become devotees, get them to engage in Krishna conscious activities. It doesn't matter what is our position. Materially, we may be the lowest, but it's not important. If we are doing it for Krishna, that's important. We're following scriptures, we're working, for the pleasure of Krishna, we'll get perfection. Prabhupada explains, for the big scale, this is required. In big scale, you cannot make all of them as brahmanas or sannyasis. No, that is not possible. If you want to make the whole human society perfect, then the Krishna Consciousness Movement should be introduced according to Krishna's instruction. <laughs> so Prabhupada understood human nature and he's saying, you cannot make everyone a Brahmana and Sannyasi. You know, when Prabhupada was beginning the Krishna Consciousness Movement, 
it appeared like that, that Prabhupada wants to make everyone a brahmana, and the brahmanas will go on, some of them will become sannyasis. But no, that wasn't Prabhupada's plan. Prabhupada knew not everybody will be brahmanas and sannyasis, but they can be Krishna conscious. Make the whole, Prabhupada said, make the whole human society perfect. This Krishna consciousness movement should be introduced according to Krishna's instruction. So everyone has a nature, let them engage that nature in Krishna's service. Not that everybody has to become a brahmana, sannyasi, that's not required. Just simply chant Hare Krishna, become devotee, hear about Krishna and the association of devotees. Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu used to say, uh, stay in whatever position you're in. Don't change your position. Just stay in that position and hear about Krishna. Right? Stane stita shruti gatan tanvan manobye ye prayasha jitopi ati asi tais trilokya. Lord Chaitanya, this is a prayer from the 10th canto of Srimad Bhagavatam, spoken by Lord Brahma. And Lord Chaitanya liked this verse very much because it puts the emphasis on hearing, that you have to hear about Krishna. I have to hear. You don't, it's not important to change your position. That's not required. Stay in whatever position you're in, but hear about Krishna. That is important. So Prabhupada explains, now we are picking up some of them best. That is another thing. But Chaitanya Mahaprabhu said, para upakara, why a certain section should be picked up. The whole mass of people will get the benefit of it. Then it is required, systematic. Then we have to introduce this Varnashram Dharma. It must be done perfectly and it is possible and people will be happy. So Prabhupada is quoting Lord Chaitanya here, para upakar, for the benefit of others, right? Parata bhumiti haila manushya janmajar janma sartaka kare kara para upakar. Lord Chaitanya was fond of this verse. He said, those who are born in Bharat Vars are very fortunate. So they should make their lives perfect and then when they are perfect in Krishna consciousness, then they should make others perfect also. And so Prabhupada was saying, why only a few people should be picked up? The whole mass of people should get the benefit of it. Everyone. Well, Prabhupada liked to think big. He didn't, he didn't just think only the few people who became devotees. He wanted to give this knowledge to everyone. So Prabhupada said, we have to introduce this Varnashram Dharma. At the same time, Prabhupada said, that it would be, wouldn't be possible in this age to reintroduce Varnashram Dharma. But he said, even if we just have the small segment of Varnashram Dharma, he said it will be very good to show people how nice this system works. If we follow the Varnashram Dharma, how nice it organizes society for everyone's benefit. And Prabhupada said, people will be happy. People will be happy if they're properly situated according to their nature and their basic needs are provided. So we want to try to organize these kind of things. So here's what we've been covering so far. 
on this unit, right? We began lesson one, Bhagavad Gita as it is, lesson two, Dharmakshitri. We spoke about Kurikshitra, different things, the advantage of the holy place. Lesson three, we heard about Varnashram, Dharma in the Bhagavad Gita. Then we went on to lesson four, contents of the Gita summarized, Dharma, sense control, transcendental Krishna consciousness, and today we've spoken about Varnashram Dharma, a support to Krishna consciousness. Right? We want to encourage Krishna consciousness, and Varnashram Dharma helps it. When we follow Varnashram Dharma, then it will help people to come to Krishna consciousness. Here's Prabhupada's quote, everything is there in the scriptures, authoritative scripture. If we take advantage of these books, we are taking so much labor to present. You can understand the science of Krishna very perfectly and your life becomes successful. Jai, Srila Prabhupada ki jai. All right, now we're going to go, we can go on to another lesson today because this is just a small lesson. So we'll go back to another lesson. Okay, so let me see. Are you able to see this sideshow? Yes, my master. You can see it, okay? Yes, yes, my master. Okay, we're going. We're going on now to unit two of this section. We're going to hear now about the yoga ladder and jnana in the Bhagavad Gita. All right, here you can see four, four lessons, the yoga system, yoga ladder, bhakti yoga, and the topmost yogi. We're going to start today with the yoga systems. Okay, the unit aims to help students understand the yoga ladder and aspects of jnana enhance the student's ability to preach the, superior, the superiority of bhakti over other yoga systems and apply it in their own life and to deepen their appreciation of the main principles of Srila Prabhupada's mood and mission. Okay, here's the different points we want to try to look over. We won't cover everything today, but we can begin it today. 
overview of chapter 3, Karma Yoga. So it begins with the question by Lord, by Arjuna, which one do you want me to do? Say one thing. Do you want me to fight or not? That was a, the beginning of the chapter. And then Krishna explains how Karma Yoga, remember we did that exercise, we showed Karma Yoga is superior to Karma Sanyas. We spent some time on that. And then the chapter goes on to describe about Karma Kanda to Karma Yoga. Karma Kanda is material activities. And the idea is from Karma Kanda we should come to Karma Yoga. Karma Kanda is material activities for our own benefit and Karma Yoga is working for the Supreme, offering the results to the Supreme. And then we have this Atmarati, no duty. We spoke about the Acharya this afternoon. We heard about Prabhupada, the Acharya, he set the example, teach by example, the Acharya principle. Everyone should be an Acharya, we should show the right example because people will follow others. You're vegetarian, other people also want to be vegetarian. And Krishna, he sets the example. And then we heard, don't disturb the attached. People are attached, the mit, mit ordinary people are attached. Don't disturb them, but show an example to them. That's important. And then the last part of the chapter, which we still have to look at, that's about the enemy, the eternal enemy, lust. So we'll have a look at that at some point. Here's Arjuna's question, right? Someone like to read for me there? Yes, go ahead. Yes, Pooja Mataji. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Hare Krishna. Arjuna Vacha Atakena Payuktoyam Babam Charity Purushaha Anichana Bivashneya Balaki Bhakti Ujitaha Translation O descendant of Vishni by what is one impelled to sinful acts, even unwillingly, as if engaged to by force? Bhagavad Gita 3.36. Thank you. So Arjuna's question. And you can see the title we, we put on top of the screen here. Nitya Vairena, lust, the eternal enemy. Right? Oh. So, how does Krishna answer this question? Oh, it's an exercise for you. <laughs> Read your allotted verse and purport. Identify general principles from Krishna's analysis of, of lust and se select a representative to present the principle. So, we have time for this. Let me see how many verses we have. Oh, three. Three. And how many people are we here? 44 Maharaj. 44? Yeah, uh, So what, three, six, we could six, six, uh, eight. We're going, we're going to have about, what, eight, eight people in a group? Six. Somewhere like that. You can put eight people in a group. And here's the other question, how could, how you would apply some of these principles in your own practice of Krishna consciousness, right? Read your verse and purport, identify general principles from Krishna's analysis of lust and present your principles and then how will you apply some of these principles in your own practice of Krishna consciousness? All right, so we want 
We have three purports, 37, 39, and 41 of the third chapter. So we want to have maybe six groups. And we have 45 people, so there will be about eight, six, eight, yeah, about eight people in some groups and seven in other groups. Can you manage that, Prabhu? Can you divide the devotees like that? Yes, yes, sure, Maharaj. Maharaj, can you put the first slide also? Yes, slide? yes. We want you to identi identify the general principles from Krishna's analysis of lust. This is an important exercise. What are the general principles? Maharaj, I have a question on this. Yes, what's your question? Um, Maharaj, as we are six groups and three verses, so shall we understand that first two groups will take one verse, next two will, uh, next group will take uh, this uh, group two and like this? Yes, group one and two will take the first verse and then group three and four will take this 39 and group five and six will take 41. Yes. The first two groups will take 37 and then the, the third and fourth group will take 39 and the fifth and sixth group, the last two groups will take 41. Is it all right? Clear? And then how you could apply these principles in your Krishna conscious practice. So we'll give you, we'll give you, how much time do you need? 15 minutes. No, 10 minutes maximum. 10 minutes, you only have to read one per port. Okay. So we are ready to break out now? Yes. Go ahead. Okay, thank you, Maharaj. Or, or similarly, Arjuna, Arjuna is also directed to use his laws, no? Any other thing? Then, Harsavardhan Prabhuji, have you, have you thought something? 
Let's put up them thinking. I want to add something, Hare Krishna. Yes, to uh, The law stage of perfected reflection of uh, the love of uh, God and Krishna. Yes. So, uh, it is the perfected reflection. And uh, uh, if, uh, if this love is uh, transferring to loss, then it cannot be satisfied. It, it, uh, it uh, always wants uh, demand, always wants satisfa material satisfaction lost. So when you uh, transfer uh, our uh, uh, serving attitude to Krishna, uh, then the lost becomes uh, love. So in this material world, there is no love, but the only lost is there. So love is uh, uh, only meant for Krishna in different, different relationships. In that point also, I am getting that. Uh, any other, if it is okay, you can also say that. Okay. We have only 45 seconds. Should I present to him? Ananda Das to him? Yes, uh, 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 whatever I present, uh, is it acceptable or not? I don't know, uh, yeah. but uh, I say that. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. Lost is the perfect reflection of the uh, love of Krishna God. Uh, we can uh, also have the principle, this principle on the text. And I, when uh, lost come, it is the greatest enemy. It is the greatest enemy in this material world. Should I, should I present? Should I present these views? Yes, sir. Thank you. Recording in progress. Okay, Hare Krishna. Oh. Hare Krishna, is everyone back? Yes, Maharaj. Okay, good. So let's hear from group number one. Rishikesh Prabhu, are you from group one? No, I'm from group two. Okay, group two is also the same verse, right? Yes. Verse number three. Yes. Yes. Verse number thirty-seven, right? That's correct, Maharaj. Yeah. Hare Krishna, uh, Maharaj. We what we identified as the general principles uh, were that uh, the lust is nitya uh, varina. Uh, it's eternal enemy. It covers the knowledge. It cannot be satisfied originates from mode of passion and uh, if left unfulfilled it turns to anger and the second part of the question was how will you apply these principles in your own krishna consciousness uh, the answer we uh, worked out as a team was that as a mo the mode of passion needs to be converted to mode of goodness and the practical way is to uh, desire to do everything for krishna surrender everything to Krishna, whether you are in work or whether you are in any of the services, give the results to Krishna. Hare Krishna. Okay. Thank you, Prabhu. Yes, the, the, uh, there's another group also on the same verse, group number one. Is there a spokesman there from group number one? Yeah, yes, Maharaj. Yes, you can add something to this? Yeah, Maharaj, uh, 
came to the conclusion that uh, uh, the general principle, this last is the only enemy for our material bundles. So last develops uh, uh, if it's a perverted condition of love of Krishna uh, when we try to uh, enjoy this material world. Then the last develops and uh, the unsatisfied last leads to wrath and uh, since everything is originated in Krishna, that is said that Janmadi Asya Jato Anvayaditarastha Asya So last has its origin also in Krishna. We can again convert this last into love by following some active prescribed activities and living in the standard method. The next part of the question that how we can apply in our uh, Krishna concept recruitment. So we have to reduce our tendency uh, to dominate uh, this material uh, uh, material nature through uh, following the principles as laid down by Guru Shadu Shastra and as prescribed by Mahaprabhu through the, uh, the chanting of Hare Krishna Mahaprabhu. Okay, <laughs> very nice. Nice to see your different versions from the same verse, but the, the principles are common. That both both groups they brought out the fact that we have to become focused more on Krishna. We have to hear more about Krishna. We have to chant about Krishna, work for Krishna, and we have to be very much aware of the danger, which comes in the form of unsatisfied lust which transforms into anger. And so we should be very cautious to avoid these things. We want to deal very carefully with the material energy, not to become overwhelmed by lust and then become degraded into influenced by the mode of ignorance and anger. That's not good, not Krishna conscious. All right, we'll go ahead. Let's hear from the other group, groups uh, three and four, who are doing text number 39. Yes, we want to hear. Hare Krishna Maharaj, we were doing uh, verse number uh, 39. So the very first thing is here, lust. Lust is, you know, leading us towards the material sense gratification for self. So, and lust cannot be satisfied. So, you know, it is like a uh, never ending fuel, like we keep, uh, you know, adding uh, fuel, uh, uh, petrol into the uh, fire. So it keeps, uh, you know, growing up. So what is happening here is that on the advancement of material civilization on the basis of sense gratification is increasing. So what we have to do it like this sense gratification, we have to control our senses. So in the, uh, you know, last chapter, we had a, a example of Amrish Maharaj that how all of his senses, uh, he controlled and devoted all of his senses into the, uh, you know, uh, devotion of Lord Krishna. So that's how he was able to control his anger, lust and everything and, you know, really spiritually advanced on uh, that platform. So so this is the one thing. So matlab, these are the things if you, uh, you know, engage all of your senses into Krishna consciousness, then you can become a Sthit Dhir Muni. So that is uh, how it goes. And the very uh, thing we, which we discussed is uh, if uh, we would have to engage in Seva also. So Seva is also one thing which uh, we can always do and, you know, our uh, senses, our lust will be kept under control so that we can, uh, you know, uh, advance on spiritual platform and not fall down into the uh, materialistic things. So you're saying we can conquer lust by being properly engaged in devotional but, service? Very pretty, yes, yes. Okay, uh, do you think everyone is everyone has the ability to engage in devotional service? Yes, 
Yeah. We all have a seed that has to be watered, and then uh, I think everybody has a natural inclination towards you know towards happiness, towards goodness. So if we know that what is the proper way that we can uh, you know definitely water that thing, and that can be brought out. Okay. Yes, we all have a, an attraction to enjoy beautiful things, and Krishna is the most beautiful. So naturally, we want to enjoy. We want to be attracted by Krishna. Yeah. So hearing about Krishna. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Let's hear from the other group who were also doing 39. Hare Krishna Maharaj, we were also doing the same verses, group 4, 3, uh, 3.39. Yes. Did you have any different points? Um, I'm not sure, but then can I press in the points? Yes. Okay, so uh, we went through the purpose and we found few points that actually stood out. So first thing is that how uh, exactly how uh, Pihu Mataji had told, it's like um, lust is a fire that will never extinguish even if we, if we keep on giving it a fuel so fuel is the fuel is how we are trying to satisfy our uh, lust and fire is the lust and the second thing is that um, uh, it's mentioned that advancement of material civilization on the basis of sense gratification means increasing the duration of material existence of living entity it means that uh, when we are advancing in this material civilization on the basis of sense gratification that is that if when we are uh, advancing but while satisfying satisfying our senses it uh, clearly means that we are we are increasing the uh, duration of our existence of our material existence as a living entity in this material world so we are getting even far away from going back to godhead because we are increasing the duration of our material existence so the next thing is that um, lust is the symbol of ignorance by which living entities kept in kept within the material world it, um, just like the last point, it's just telling that lust is the reason uh, or the symbol of ignorance by which the living entity is kept inside the material world for a longer time. So, uh, it is said that while one enjoys sense gratification, you might feel a little happy, you might feel like really happy, but actually that happiness that you are, uh, um, like that you're feeling, it's not exactly the pure happiness it's actually your ultimate and enemy of this uh, enemy because it's just getting you away from the absolute happiness that is krishna so if you're having um, lust that and you're feeling happy of that it's not actually happiness but it's actually taking you away from the real happiness that is going back to our uh, eternal home that is koloka vrindavan so, so are you saying that we should go back and live in the caves then? You want, you, you know, it sounds like you're against material advancement of civilization. Do you want us all to become primitive again? No, not exactly. But like, as we all know, while doing uh, work, we can actually connect it with Krishna. Whatever work we do, we can actually connect it with Krishna. In that way, we are doing our work to like, uh, sustain ourselves at the same time we are trying to connect with krishna so that we go back to godhead no. so how are we going to put up with the material world then because you said material advancement of civilization is going to keep us in material existence going to prolong our material existence um, so for that we need to do more, like how Pihu Mataji had told, we need to do more sevas, like more services unto the Lord, so that we we don't like completely get uh, emerged in the material civilization based on our sense gratification. So we have to be very careful. Yeah. We have to be very careful, it's like playing with fire, but not get burned. Yeah. So you're not against material advancement? Uh, I mean, 
I I am against it, but then like we can't entirely avoid it. Also, since we are living in this material world, only thing that we can do is that we can try to be careful and stay away from it as much as possible, and try to do our uh, Krishna consciousness activities uh, more sincerely and uh, properly. Okay. So your solution to conquering lust? Yeah, I think I'm how, not sure. How how what is the the best program to conquer lust? Um uh, engaging engaging yourself in Krishna consciousness that's what I think. Just be proper fully engaged in Krishna. Yeah. Okay. So no time for anything else, only Krishna. Yeah. So you don't work, you don't have a job. I don't have a job. You don't study. I mean, I do study. I study. Oh, you do study. Yeah. Only Bhagavad Gita. Uh, no, I actually study the uh, material things also, like for the school. Oh. Okay. But like, as I'm taking this course, I'm trying to, while studying also, I'm trying to actually engage myself in studying Krishna consciousness too. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you, Maharaj. All right. Then we have the other two groups who were dealing with text number 41. Yes. Yes, I am Krishna Maharaj. Please accept my humble obeisances. All lawyers should have broken. Uh, so our group, first we decided to um, understand what lust means and uh, where it came from. So of course uh, in text 37 it's mentioned lust is actually um, eternal love for Krishna except it comes in contact with the mode of passion so it becomes lust. And the nature of lust in uh, text 41 it's described that lust uh, destroys the urge for self-realization and specific knowledge of the self. So it sort of draws us away from Krishna. And then uh, we, we try to figure out how we can uh, solve this problem. And there we saw that, you know, lust, we cannot, we, the, the, we shouldn't have this mentality that um, I'm having this desire today. And if I satisfy that desire, this desire will go away. Because lust is like, um, it's like fire. And then we satisfying these desires is like pouring petrol into it. And that's only going to make it worse. So um, we should not do that. Rather, in uh, text 41, it says that we, uh, the Lord advised Arjuna to regulate the senses from the very beginning so that he could curb the, sin the greater sinful enemy. So the way to uh, stopping us is to regulate the senses. And also, um, I think the uh, um, Lord Hanuman is also uh, given as an example. Um, I think it's in text 38. Uh, no, text 37, 38, uh, where Hanuman used his wrath and, you know, um, wrath is like uh, when it comes in contact with the moon of ignorance. So Hanuman used his wrath in the service of Lord Ram. So in our group, um, we discussed and we came to the conclusion that we can also engage ourselves in devotional service and we have to dovetail our desires, uh, you know, towards uh, Krishna consciousness. Like if you have a desire to eat something, we eat prashadam instead. So in this way, we don't get any uh, bad reactions. Uh, rather, it's purifying to ourselves. And also one of our group members um, came up with the verse, a part of the verse, Hrishikena uh, Rishikesha Sevanam Bhaktir Uchate. So if you want to control our senses, then we have to uh, continuously perform devotional service to Hrishikesha, the master of the senses. Mm -hmm. So. The, your method in conquering lust is regulation of the senses. Yes, Maharaj. And also dovetailing the senses to Krishna consciousness. Okay. And at the same time, regulating the senses in such a manner that the senses are used in Krishna conscious activities. Yes, Maharaj. Okay. All right. The other group? Final group? Hare Krishna Maharaj. Can I speak? Yes, please. Uh, here, this is the conclusion of uh, uh, about the lust enemy as an our enemy. 
So here I found around seven principles. Uh, as uh, lust is the destroyer of knowledge and self-realization, that is the first principle. And uh, then in the purport, this Krishna himself says, and then in the purport, Lord advised Arjuna to control, to regulate his senses from the very beginning. And the second uh, uh, principle is that, that uh, knowledge of spirit, that we are not the body, we are spirit soul. So, jnana refers to that. That is the second principle. Third principle, we found uh, the living entity is the part and parcel of Lord and he is simply meant to serve the Lord. So, that is the third principle. And lust is only the pervaded in reflection of love of God. So, that is the uh, third, uh, fourth principle, which is the natural enemy to living entity. Then uh, fifth principle is the Krishna, God consciousness, we should go for very beginning. That is uh, to get the natural love of God unless to get entitled with lust. So that is uh, fifth learning. Sixth learning is uh, when love of God deteriorates into the lust, then it is very, very difficult to control and come back to the normal condition. That is our sixth learning. And then seventh learning is that, uh, so we should start learning in the right from the beginning and turn the lust into the, uh, that is eighth one, turn the lust into love of God. That is the highest perfection state of human life. So we got eight uh, principles from the purport, right from Rod Krishna to Srila Prabhupada's uh, uh, teaching and uh, how to uh, follow these principles how to in our practice so uh, first is first we should desire whatever desire comes in mind uh, due to senses we should be it should be an offering to krishna suppose we want to eat gulab jamun so the first uh, we should offer it to krishna then we should accept it so to a pilgrimage we should uh, suppose we uh, buy, uh, in, we are bound in material world and we have some uh, family function, uh, uh, marriage in some place, so we have to go there. But if we do it as an offering to Krishna, if we go, uh, suppose we are going some uh, in North India, in Lucknow, then we can go to Nemisharanya or nearby places where uh, pilgrimage is there. So in that way, we can convert our desires into an offering to Krishna. And then second is senses should be engaged in Krishna's service. Like eyes should be engaged in reading and having darshan of Lord. Ears should be engaged in hearing and uh, in hearing. And uh, tongue should be engaged in eating prashadam and speaking about the glories of Krishna or telling about Krishna to anyone. Uh, and uh, like foot, feet can be engaged in going to the temple and like this. A way we can use our senses and we can use even our capabilities, our talents. Uh, suppose someone is good in uh, singing, so he can sing for Krishna. He can uh, not, uh, he don't sing about film songs. He should sing about uh, about Krishna's songs. If someone is good in art, so like I am an artist, I used to, te I'm teaching from last 20 years uh, to small children, 22 years. Uh, arts, but now I am teaching in Krishna consciousness also through his Chennai. I am making art videos for them. So in this way, they can use this. I practically inculcate in my uh, talent. Although I am running my art classes also, but trying to attract those children towards uh, uh, use the, so that they can also use from right from the beginning their talent into Krishna's uh, service. So in that way, we can use uh, from right, very beginning, like Bhaktralal classes are there. So uh, I'm an, I'm a teacher of Bhaktralal class also through Iskwan Chennai. So in that way, I'm, uh, we can give Krishna to all small children, those who are born in a uh, material family, not in, in a devotee family. Mm. So this is these are the principles what we can follow. Okay. And one last thing I want to say, uh, as Sheila um, Bhakti Siddhan Saraswati Thakur, he said that use everything, each and everything in service of Krishna. Even he used his car, even he used his shoes for like uh, everything for 
service of Krishna. He sets an example uh, for us. So can we use lust also in the service of Krishna? The gopis yes, towards, to, towards love, like we should make our lust into love of Krishna. By loving Krishna, mm -hmm. by loving the uh, devotees, by uh, loving each and every living entity, like every, even, even the insects also, everything. Because the gopis, they had lust for Krishna, right? The gopis, they had lust for Krishna. Yes. So their lust was also and was directed towards Krishna. So that was uh, devotees' love towards Krishna. Mm -hmm. So it converted into the love. <laughs> yeah, in, in the pure form, it's love. All right. Thank you very much. You did a very very detailed analysis. Very nice. Very good. Mm -hmm. Thank you so All much. Glory. All glories to Guru Maharaj, all glories to Srila Prabhupada. Yeah, very nice to hear from you. You have a lot of ideas how to utilize everything in Krishna's service. Right? Thank you. Thank so, you, Maharaj. So we should note from this the nature of lust and how it's the eternal enemy. It burns like fire, never satisfied. Where is it located? It's in the senses, it's in the mind, and it can be in the intelligence also. So Lord Krishna has given us a lot of information about lust. He's identified the enemy and he's told us where we can find it. And he's also told us how we can conquer it, right? We have to cultivate transcendental knowledge and we have to regulate the senses. And in this way we will conquer over this uh, all-devouring sinful enemy <laughs> which uh, takes away all of our Krishna consciousness. All right? So we'll just continue for a little while. Oh. <laughs> uh, well, maybe it's a bit... All right, someone like to read for us? The yoga systems. Yes, Hare yes, Krishna Maharaj. Factually, bhakti yoga is the ultimate goal, but to analyze bhakti yoga, minutely, one has to understand these offer these other yogas. Six point forty seven per book. Keep reading. In the previous chapter, as a prelude to the bhakti the Bhagavad Gita, many different parts were explained. This, is, this was all presented unsystematically. A more organized outline of the path would be necessary for action and understanding. In other words, by his question, he is clearly the path of Krishna consciousness, clearing the path of Krishna consciousness for all students who seriously want to understand the mystery of the Bhagavad Gita. Right. So we want to see the progression here between chapters 3 to chapter 6. Chapter 3 was on Karma Kanda and Karma Yoga. Then chapter 4 goes into Jnana Yoga. Jnana Yoga is higher on the yoga ladder than Karma Yoga. Karma Yoga is the yoga of activities, but there's no knowledge. But chapter 4 brings us to the platform of Jnana. And then chapter 5 is Karma Sanyash Yoga, which is about, it, it's actually Jnana Yoga because it's giving up work. Jnana Yogis generally, they don't work, they just stop. They think no point to do anything. They have knowledge. Hmm? And then chapter 6 will go on and we'll hear about Dhyana Yoga, meditation. So that's what's there for us. So the karma yoga, jnana yoga, karma sanyas yoga, jnana yoga, right? You can see that the, there's a progression there, higher and higher. From karma yoga to jnana yoga, and then to karma sanyas yoga, and then to jnana yoga. When you, when you get that knowledge, 
then you meditate on the super soul. That is chapter 6. All right, so we're going to stop here. We'll continue from this point tomorrow and we'll hear more about the yoga processes, karma yoga, jnana yoga and dhyana yoga. Right? Karma yoga, remember? Is everyone clear? Karma yoga means performing your duty in a detached manner, not being attached to the result. Jnana yoga, cultivating knowledge, and dhyana yoga, meditation. Oh, <laughs> another exercise in your group. <laughs> okay, well that's tomorrow, we'll do that tomorrow. Are there any questions today? Everyone's okay? You learned, you learned about the lust, you learned about the third chapter, the end of the third chapter we hear about lust, and we heard about the, uh, the importance of showing the example, the acharya principle, working to teach others, better to show by example rather than to just give instructions. Actually, we could just mention here today, maybe you can think about this tomorrow, then we don't have to spend much time on it. But you can think over about the three-minute drama, showing the yoga process, right? And there are three different processes. There's the three yoga processes, karma yoga, jnana yoga, and dhyana yoga. You can think how to present a three-minute drama showing the yoga processes. Karma yoga, dhyana yoga, and dhyana yoga. Karma, jnana, and dhyana. So, think about how to do one of these dramas. Or you can think about all three. Then show us how to present these yoga systems to other people. Hmm? There's karma yoga, text 48, karma yoga, perform your duty Arjuna, abandon all attachment to success or failure, don't be attached to the result, such equanimity is called yoga. What kind of yoga? Karma yoga, unattached to the, you do your duty, equipoised. So this is karma yoga. And then jnana, jnana refers to knowledge of the self as distinguished from non-self or in other words knowledge that the spirit soul is not the body. And here's the verse you all know from the second chapter, the jnani. He understands he's not the body. So jnana yoga is a linking process. Empirically, it is called jnana yoga. When the linking process is predominantly empirical, it is called jnana yoga. Based on observation. When the linking process is based on observation. How to do jnana yoga? Here, it's on a well-known well verse, fifth chapter, the process of jnana yoga, you don't take part in the sources of misery due to contact with the material senses. Such pleasures have a beginning and an end. The wise man does not delight in them. And then jnana yoga, what do you have to do? You have to, to meditate, you have to have a deer skin, you have to go away to a secluded place and put your deerskin on the ground with a cloth and you, it, you should sit on it and you should practice yoga. Fix the mind on one point. Okay. So like that, here actually you could say we, pre we pretty much covered this uh, chapter, this exercise. We had the overview of the third chapter. The overview of the third chapter began with karma yoga. And then we heard about how 
karma yoga, karma kanda yoga, karma kanda comes to karma yoga, and then we heard about the importance of setting an example and don't disturb the minds of the attached. And Lord Krishna also shows an example. And then we heard also about the enemy, the all-devouring sinful enemy, lust, and how to conquer lust. And then we had the overview of the progression through chapters 3 to 6. Chapter 3 was Karma Yoga, Chapter 4 was Jnana Yoga, a bit higher, and Chapter 5 was Sannyasa Yoga, and Chapter 6 was Dhyana Yoga. And there were, we also showed different verses describing Karma Kanda, Karma Yoga, they all mentioned there in Chapters 3 to 6. And how to practice these different Yogas? we showed with the verses. So nothing very difficult there. Contemporary philosophies of life which reflect the principles of these yoga processes. Contemporary philosophies of life reflect the principles. You know, some people practice, you know, they, we see some people do meditation, the dhyana yoga especially, the, they like to go and meditate, sit and meditate, press the nose, pranayama, other people, jnanis, jnanis, they're studying the Vedanta Sutra, they're studying these books, reflecting on the principle, the message of the Shastra, speculation. And the karma yogi, working for the benefit of others, doing work for others, social welfare, act karma kanda activities, karma yoga. Karma Yoga is more connected to working for God and Karma Kanda is working for benefit of people. General principles from Krishna's analysis of lust. Burns like fire, never satisfied, all devouring sinful enemy. And the application of principles in our own practice of Krishna consciousness. Right? We want to be regulated and we want to cultivate spiritual knowledge. We want to be very careful to avoid anger, not allow ourselves to become degraded, not don't allow, when we're, we may be influenced by lust, we can be degraded. So we want to avoid all that, be very con conscious how to avoid lust. All right, are there any questions on this today? Uh, yes, Maharaj. Hare Krishna, Maharaj. Hare Krishna. Uh, I, I have a question, uh, you know, from the beginning of the class, uh, where you told about uh, two types of uh, society, the communist and the capitalist, uh, and their, um, you know, the consciousness, uh, one being uh, in the Shudra mode, the communist, you know, all they want is a worker class, and the other one uh, focuses more on the business, where it's uh, mixed more. So um, I just wanted to know or clarify. Now we we uh, generally in the society we have been uh, working uh, some companies. Everything is uh, salary based remunerations. So what category do we come under? And how do we change if we want to say, suppose one person is a Shudra, uh, how do we qualify to move upwards into the Varna? Well, the Varna is actually external. You see, we're more concerned with the internal nature. And our internal nature, should that we should be cultivating. Internally, we're all servants of Krishna. It's not that we, we shouldn't just be worrying too much about our situation in the Varnashram, but we're more concerned with our spiritual situation, how we can actually elevate ourselves in the spiritual platform. Lord Chaitanya taught us that he doesn't identify with any Varna or any Ashram, but he's simply the servant of the servant of the servant of the Supreme Lord Krishna. We want to come to that kind of consciousness. 
to, ele to think about elevating ourselves in the varnas, that can be done, but it's, it, you know, it's, it's temporary and material. It's not spiritual, these positions in the varnas. A devotee, one who is Krishna conscious, he may be in any of the different varnas, you know, he may be working in, in a job and he, he may, you may say he's a sudra, but you go home, he worships a deity and he's very brahminical in his behavior and culture. Although he may be working in a sudra job. No, in the, this is Kali Yuga. You know, in, in the Kali Yuga, everyone is sudra by birth. So even people who are highly educated, as I said, like engineers or scientists, you know, they're actually, they may work in a big corporation. They're actually sudra, they're doing sudra work. If you want to elevate yourself to a higher level, how do you do it? Well, <laughs> you know, you have to change your psychophysical nature to some extent. You know, it's not an easy thing to become a businessman or to, to become a Vaishya, to take up farming and do cow protection and so on. It's nice, but to actually do it, you know, to make a success of it is a challenge. You have to have some experience and some good training in it, and you need a lot of luck also. So, to become a Vaishya is not easy to become a kshatriya to take a kshatriya position well again it's a, it, it's a, you have to have the, that psychophysical nature that you're an organizer you're a manager you're used to bossing people around and getting people to do things you know it's not everyone's nature and similarly brahminical not everyone can become a brahmana but that doesn't mean they're not devotees. What's important is that people cultivate their Krishna consciousness and become devotees of Krishna, because that's what's going to make the difference. The Varnashram is going to keep you in the material world, but Krishna consciousness is going to take you back to Godhead. So we want to be thinking about how to elevate our Krishna consciousness, how to become more firmly situated at the lotus feet of Krishna. And we do that by devotional service. The more we are focused on devotional service, then that is actually Krishna, that is the perfection of our spiritual life. The Varnashram principles are there to organize society and they are external. So externally you work and you do some job, some duty. As I said, we practice Daivi Varnashram. And so you have to be a bit flexible there. You can't think, I'm a Brahmana, I don't do anything else. You have to do what's required, you know? Sometimes you have to think how to do it, just like Prabhupada Prabhupada was, sometimes he was looking over the accounts, you know, he, he was not all the day just only writing books. He was also managing the society, telling people what to do and how to organize the temple and how to keep accounts. And he, they would ask Prabhupada, can we do this, can we do that? And Prabhupada would advise them what kind of things they could do to raise funds and to make money for the society. And so Prabhupada also had some, he had some Vaishya experience. Prabhupada used to be a businessman before he became uh, retired. He was running his own business. So he had, he did have some experience in business. And he, he could, to some extent, he could utilize that in organizing the Krishna consciousness movement. You know, he taught the devotees everything. Whatever money you get, it has to go in the bank. You don't spend it. You, whatever money you get, you, first you put it in the bank and then you can spend it. Everything has to be recorded. So these kind of things. Details.
So you want, if you really want to elevate yourself, like to the in the Varna, in the Varna Ashram stage, you want to elevate yourself. Maybe you want to come to become a better Brahmana. Well, Brahmanas they do six duties. They, they either worship the deity or they teach others to worship the deity. They study the scriptures or they teach the scriptures. And they accept charity and they give charity. So that's really what's allowed for someone who's a strict Brahmana. So if you have a wife and family and children and so on, then sometimes it's a, a, it can be a challenge to maintain family when you follow, just do these activities. Unless the temple is cooperative, the temple may be supporting you, they may be providing for you. But it's, it's a, mm, a challenge sometimes for, to the Brahminical nature. We see a lot of people who were Brahmanas, they gave up the Brahminical culture in order to maintain their families, to maintain their living and a, on a better standard. We could say, well, they didn't have to do that, but they, they did it anyway. If you can do it, then very good. Drona, Dronacharya, of course, Dronacharya was a Brahmana, and he took up teaching military arts in order to maintain his family. He was teaching use of different weapons. So Brahmana is also to teach. Whatever you know, you teach it to others. That is also Brahminical. Thank you, Maharaj, so much. Hare Krishna. Yes, we have some other questions there. Yes, Maharaj. Manjari. Hare, Hare Krishna, Maharaj. As you asked uh, one question to the group B uh, about that material advancement is not an like is an obstacle towards Krishna consciousness. So I would like to answer that. I don't want to ask, but I want to answer that. Uh, uh, that material advancement cannot become uh, an obstacle in Krishna consciousness if it is used in Krishna's service. Like uh, we are using our laptops, that is also a material advancement, our iPads, in mobile phones, or, or to connect to Bhakti Shastri classes like that. Everything can be used in Krishna's service. So on that basis, I thought uh, this painting to children through my video, Here, laptop is used to connect the classes, mobile phone to get the link, and uh, guitar can be used for singing Krishna, uh, for singing Krishna, and uh, even uh, television can be used for getting lectures or stories about Krishna. So this painting, even children, they enjoyed a lot. So just saying, everything, material advancement can be used in service of Krishna. So lust can be converted into love of Krishna. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you for your painting. Very nice. All, all mercy from Krishna, all glories to Vaishnavas from whom I am learning and all glories to you also, Maharaj. Hare Krishna. Yes, we have another question here, is it? Maharaj, uh... In Prema Vivarta, it is mentioned like if one wants to have constant association with the Lord Chaitanya, uh, he should remember the pastime of Lord Chaitanya chastising Junior Haridas and also Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur saying that uh, we should beat the mind with the broomstick and with the shoes. So this is with uh, regard to lust for devotees. Uh, in principle, uh, they don't violate grossly. Uh, but that is a great struggle in the subtle level. Uh, so could you uh, throw some highlight on this, Maharaj? <laughs> yes, well, it's an ongoing struggle, right? On the subtle level, we always have to be on guard against the mind. And as we said, the lust is not only in the mind, it's also situated in the intelligence as well, as the senses, it's there. So pervading the subtle body. 
So we have to be constantly on guard. That's the, that's the principle that pay attention, be attentive to what's going on around us. And what is our situation? Where is our mind wandering to? What, what are we doing with the mind? And how are we using our intelligence for Krishna? We want to bring in everything which we have, all of our resources for the service of Krishna. And so with our intelligence we want to think about how to serve Krishna and certainly with the mind we want to keep that desire we want to please Krishna, how to please Krishna, and utilizing the senses. Yes, it, so it, it's all based on being attentive. Don't be slack. Just like uh, there was one devotee, he, he used to be a boxer. So he told me, he said, when you go in the ring, the, the important thing is you have to keep your hands up. You have to be on, keep your guard up. You put your hands up over your face, it's a guard. So the same way in Krishna consciousness, we have to always be on guard against the material energy. And the material energy, remember, is Krishna's energy. It's very powerful, very difficult to overcome, and it can influence even our, our intelligence. We can become bewildered and be... We think that, oh, I don't have to worry, I'm free, I, I'm, I'm Krishna conscious. And so if we're thinking like that, then we're in trouble. If we're thinking, I don't have any problem, I don't have any danger, I'm fine, that's the problem. We always want to be careful to be on guard and be attentive to the situation. Okay, Prabhu? Thank you, Maharaj. All right, any other questions? Okay, then we'll see you tomorrow. Thank you very much. Srila Prabhupada Ki. Go back to Vrinda Ki. Recording stopped. Bye.